he was a new man, or he'd have known better. No old timer on the Timber Gang would have been rash enough to expose himself to the deadly banner of Dragon Hiram, Teamster Ordinary, and Humorous Extraordinary in the employment of the Dry Branch Lumber Company. The newcomer had been taken on that morning by Silas Turner, the woods boss, and put to work on the skitter crew. He was a seasoned-looking roughneck in new overalls, with new rawhide laces in his stout logger's boots. He handled the axe with a skill that excited the admiration of the foreman and the envy of the crew. When the noon whistle blew, the skitter boys hustled down to the mess shack of Camp 7, where the loggers and the loaders of the Turner outfit had already gone through the washing up process and were seated about the shack, awaited on Dinner Boy Pete's artistic rendition of every man's favorite tune on the brass dinner bell. Last of all came Hiram Parsons. As usual, he had taken the time to rub down and feed his big Clydesdales before coming into the shack for his own feed. He was a big, loosely constructed mountaineer who had lived a rigorous life in the woods. His full-fed cheeks shone rosily above a week's worth of reddish stubble mixed with streaks of insipid gray. He crossed the foot log over the branch and greeted the crowd with stentorian jolly. Howdy, fellas. It's the best time of the day once again. Then he caught the sight of the stranger seated on an inverted tub and leaning against the wall of the shack, his hat on the ground beside him. Howdy, stranger, Hiram shouted at the top of his voice. How does your capacity appear to stantiate? The effort at a pleasantry was older than the oldest man in the works, older than everything in sight except for the ancient hills, but not too old to raise a roar of laughter, supposedly at the new man's expense. All joined in the laugh except for the stranger himself. He looked a bit sheepish, and when the last hawing had died away, he responded cheerfully. Well, I reckon I'm doing all right, mister. How do you get along? Hiram Parsons had not come by his name of Dragon Hiram by accident. You see, he had a way of making jokes at others' expense. All in fun, just passing the time, really. And laughter, it seemed to help pass the time. It mattered not to Hiram or his audiences that his jokes had been told countless times. They were delivered with such dispatch and gusto and followed by such explosions and reverberations of his own laughter that they carried the crowd by storm. The luckless victim could only cower in a shell hole until the barrage was lifted. It was unfortunate, therefore, that the stranger in the camp should have drawn the enemy's fire by shooting off his own innocent little pop gun by asking, how do you get along? Why, partner, I got here on my feet. How do you reckon I got here? And the gang screamed their mirth as though they had not heard the same old mountain gag a hundred times before. The new man looked a little dazed, but he said nothing until the merriment had subsided again. And then he smilingly observed, Well, I reckon you drugged me pretty good that time, didn't you, mister? Instantly, the answer flashed, Well, I tell you, you look like buzzards that drug you until they rubbed all the hair off the back of your head. This was an obvious reference to the bald spot the stranger had exposed when he removed his hat. In the roar that followed in the second hit, even the dinner boy Pete joined in. Even his side shook in cadence with the rhythmic dinner bell solo he was performing. At the table, the new hand, whose time card bore the name of Amos Hensley, found himself seated opposite of Dragon Hiram, who, flushed with two fresh triumphs of his wit, was still thirsty for blood. Hensley was too busy with knife and fork, mostly knife, to take much part in the boisterous mealtime banner. But whenever he did venture to take even the most commonplace remark, it was greeted with salvo from the bristling fort across the table. To be sure, the shots went wild, aimed at nothing and hitting nothing, but Hiram's contagious laughter never failed to set the company in a roar. Hensley, having been three days out of a job, ate with the appetite that attracted the attention of every man in the logging camp. And while all the rest of the men were tilting back their chairs, exploring their pockets for goose quill toothpicks, he was just entering the pie phase of the dyadic cycle. This circumstance offered Dragon Hiram the pretext for a pardon shot. Take your time, partner, he counseled as he rose to leave. By the looks of it, your daddy ate powerful fast, and your mammy ate a long time, and you just apparently took after both of them. <laughs> If Amos Hensley, though, was seriously embarrassed by his warm reception at the hands of the camp humorist, 
He kept that fact to himself. Already established in the good graces of the boss by his deafness in handling logs, he soon won the hearts of the men with an equal deafness in spinning yarns. Some of his first efforts as a storyteller were taken seriously, as they were apparently meant to be, but it was soon a matter of common knowledge and local pride that Camp 7 was honored by the presence of a fancy liar of no ordinary gifts. You see, if there's one thing that every woodsman holds an equal esteem with brilliant banner, it's artistic lying. Crude everyday lying, he righteously scorns as contemptible and unscriptural. But for the venerable whopper that spurns the petty bounds of facts and figures, in the higher interest of spellbinding idealism, he knows no feeling but admiration. Amos Hensley was that kind of a liar, a champion of the lumber camps, who wore his title of Lion Amos with modest but honorable pride. Within a week, he had become a formidable rival of Dragon Hiram as the chief intellectual ornament of Camp 7. Of evenings in the bunkhouse, the favorite program would usually open up with the strains of Sourwood Mountain or Arkansas Traveler from Fletch McCurry's banjo, accompanied by a clog dance from Dinner Boy Pete, whose scowl-bottom feet flopped and shuffled on the boards like a complete rhythm section accompanying the banjo. Then, over in the corner, Amos Hensley would begin. When I was a filing saws for the Carolina Spruce Company over on the Yancey side of Grandfather Mountain, there was an old like fella. He come there by the name of Stop that racket, you fellas, someone would call out. Lion Amos is finna tell another one. And Amos would have the floor with one of his homely romances, whether of the tallest hemlock, the biggest band saw, or the pullingest team of horses, the cussingest boss, or the luckiest hands of cards that ever was on land or sea. Seldom, though, did the evening's entertainment end without a sword clash between Lion Amos and Dragon Hiram. The gang expected it, and Hiram always strove to please. For him, it was a never-failing triumph, and cheaply won at that. Occasionally, though, Amos would put up at least a semblance of a counter-offensive. Being nobody's fool in particular, he would sometimes deliver a neat retort that one of its merits would have put the laugh squarely on his tormentor. But you see, Amos's manner was too mild, and his humor was too subtle for an audience schooled in the knock-down, drag-out methods of his rival. But the lane will turn, and it's a long worm that has no turning, or whatever the proverb says. It's also well known that even the thickest skin has a quick place under it if you stick the pen deep enough. Speaking of skins, there were surface indications that Hiram's pen had found somebody at home. After one particularly vicious thrust, the coarse laughter of the crowd had been prolonged by the sight of the victim's face, which had gone white instead of red, and while his lips tightened and the warm sparkle of his black eyes turned a cold glint. I figured for a minute Lion Amos was about to get his fighting britches on. Old man Lawson confided to Abram Mullins, his bunk mate, as they laced their boots the next morning. Now, Mr. Lawson, Abram declared, Lion Amos is fighting britches are locked up in his trunk and the key's lost. That fella can take anything that anybody can throw at him. Little did the rough but kindly men of Camp 7 dream that tragic events impended, under whose sobering stress all petty animosities would be forgotten in a moment. All the long, hot Sunday afternoon, the crew sat outside the bunkhouse, smoking, playing cards, nailing massive half-soles on the worn boots, and mending harnesses. Silas Turner, the boss, had taken the narrow-gauge engine, number six, with three men, including Lion Amos, to inspect a new trussle that had been thrown together across a ravine up near the upper end of the line. Dragon Hiram sat on a rude bench on the shady end of the house, from which position he commanded a view up the track. The heat waves from the rails shimmered in the boiling sun, Hiram seemed to only be smoking and dozing, but in reality, he was in the throes of cognition, trying to frame some more subtle and mirth-provoking banner that had ever fallen upon the responsive ears of his loyal constituents. Suddenly, a figure appeared far up the track, 
rounding the curve at a rapid walking pace. In a moment, the characteristic slew-footed list identified the walker as Lion Amos. For so hot a day, Amos was certainly making good time. I wonder what's a pushing Lion Amos, called out one of the skitter crew. He sure is working the slew leg for all it's worth. Hey, let's get him started on one of his big yarns, said another. And at that suggestion, an evil smile lurked on Dragon Hiram's broody face. That's a plum good idea, boys, he said. I'll banner him to do himself loud this time, and then I've got a brand new drag that I'll get off on him. And sent in the battle from afar, the gang began instinctively to close around the champion. As soon as Amos's sprightly limp brought him within hailing distance, Hendrick sang out, Hey there, Amos. Lighten your load and rest your saddle. Won't you come and get a chair and sit down and tell us the biggest lie you ever heard? We're just all a pining away, waiting to hear a good old whopper and a biggin'. But a glance at Amos's face showed that it was no errand of mirth-making that he had come for. Tragedy was written there. He didn't even smile at the jester's words, but he staggered to a place in the center of the group where he stood panning, a breathless herald of important news. Fellas, there's trouble back up yonder. Number six busted through that trussle at the gap, and Silas Turner is a lion under her, pinned against a pile of cross ties. He can talk, though, and he's set for Hiram to get a crew of the best men in the camp and fetch the axes and block the tackle so you can hoist the trucks off of him. It'll be three hours before the wrecking train can get up there. Instantly, Camp 7 was astir. Stowered men, chosen by Hiram, nearly ran over each other in their haste to grab ropes and pulleys and axes. Hiram was a dozen yards ahead of the rest of the men when the relief party set out on the six-mile walk. Now, he wasn't a walker, as most mountaineers are, but he felt complimented that the boss, in his hour of need, had recognized him as the man to pick a crew and come to the rescue. He therefore took the lead all the way, albeit with vast expenditure of wind and water, for he was panting like a farrier's bellows and sweating like a leaky barrel. Come on, fellas, just as fast as you can, boys. He stopped now and then to urge while he mopped his steaming brow and caught his breath. We gotta keep a hit it, boys, and help the boss get out of trouble. I reckon I've been a little rough on Lion Amos. He was might and I gave out when he got to camp, but he said he would come right back with us after he blowed his spell. I reckon I'm gonna let up dragging him so hard, seeing how game he showed himself. An hour went by as Hiram's party had toiled and wheezed four of the six upgrade miles toward the wreck. Thirty minutes more and the hard march would be over. Hiram's feet were blistered and the heavy coil of rope on his back grew heavier and hotter every minute. Suddenly, the Sabbath stillness of the mountains was broken by the shriek of a locomotive from somewhere up the gorge. The weird swelling of the shrill notes indicated that the engine was approaching. The men stopped in amazement. There was no log train in the woods today, and the wrecker couldn't arrive for Beachmont in less than two hours from now. And number six, oh, she was lying wrecked in a ravine two miles above. What in thunder do you make of that, Hiram? Wiley Anderson gasped between his labored gasp for wind. Them fellas couldn't have got six off the track by themselves, could they? Well, gosh, no. Of course they couldn't. It's got me guessing for sure, though, Hiram admitted. Let's go on. We'll be finding out something before long now. They pressed on again, but they had gone less than a hundred yards before they heard the whistle again. This time, much nearer, they stood for a moment, puzzling over the strange situation. The rumble of the approaching engine was heard, and within a few minutes, the familiar head end of number six nosed around a sharp curve ahead. She was coasting down the steep grade toward the camp, and when Hiram flagged her down with his red bandana handkerchief, the engineer brought her to a stop where the relief crew stood. Where in thunder are you and's headed for? Are you hunting a bee tree? Silas Turner asked as he leaned out the cab window beside the engineer. Boss, how in the name of Tom Walker did you get her back on the rails? Was you hurt bad? Hiram asked in his reply. Get what back on the rails? Uh, who was hurt? What are you ones talking about? You must have found a still house instead of a bee tree. The boss man shot back. In that moment, Drag and Hiram began to see the light. What did you fellas do with Lion Amos? Why, we didn't do anything with him. After we started up towards the new trestle, we found it was too crowded in this little box of a cab, and we made him get off a mile after the camp and walk back. The boss exclaimed. Did anything happen to him? Well... It ain't happened to him yet, boss, but it's about to, Dragon Hiram said as he rose painfully from the stump which he had dropped to rest. 
Then the men in the cab and the sweating huskies on the ground began to see the light. First they grinned foolishly, <laughs> then they chuckled, and then they roared until the rocky canyon walls roared back at them. And Dragon Hiram, nah, he did what most juggers do when the laugh comes the other way. He got mad, not just peeved or provoked. He was mad all over. He was so mad he couldn't talk. He couldn't even cuss. He just sputtered. Then he clambered up on the tender with the rest of the crew and sputtered while number six coasted into camp. The men in the camp were lined up in front of the mess shack as the would-be rescuers and the would-be have been rescued climbed off the engine. It was a joyous reception. The big roughnecks squealed and howled and bellowed their delight. But Dragon Hiram, he scanned the faces in the crowd for the one face that was conspicuously missing. Where is that low-down lying skunk? He shouted above the unabated chorus of mirth. Well, he's done went and gone from here, Hiram, Jeff Lawson replied, with happy tears still streaking his face. He said he had a good job waiting for him down at the Carolina Spruce, and he reckoned it was a good time to go get it. But there's his comments that he asked us to give you, so you'd remember him by. And he pointed towards a placard, crudely lettered on a cracker box lid, that was tacked above the mess shack door. And it read, To Dragon Hiram. So long, partner. I'm sorry I couldn't think of a bigger lie to tell you. But remember this. He that drags the last, drags the furthest. Thank you.